This is the second in a series of lectures on imaging of the thyroid gland. So what are the different types of thyroid cancer? I like to think of thyroid cancer as four plus one. There are four types of thyroid cancer and then you can't forget about lymphoma. So let's talk about the four types of thyroid cancer. The most common is papillary, and then there is follicular. Sometimes papillary and follicular are lumped together and called differentiated thyroid cancer. They're treated in a similar way. There is medullary thyroid cancer, which arises from a different cell within the thyroid gland. And there is anaplastic or dedifferentiated uh, thyroid cancer, uh, which is the most aggressive of these types. And then here in brackets, lymphoma that is not actually uh, cancer of thyroid cells, obviously, um, but it can affect the thyroid gland and needs to be on our differential. First, let's talk about papillary thyroid carcinoma. This is the most common type of thyroid cancer. It tends to affect young females. It is characterized by the speckled calcifications that we already discussed. And when it spreads, it tends to spread to surrounding lymph nodes. These lymph nodes are often cystic and may look just like a branchial cleft cyst. Since these patients will s sometimes be teenagers, there's a fair amount of overlap in the demographics, and this can be very confusing. Thankfully, papillary thyroid carcinoma is curable. Some 95% of patients are cured. Um, there are aggressive forms of papillary carcinoma, such as the tall cell variant, that are somewhat harder to treat. Follicular carcinoma is famed for its propensity to hematogenous spread. It spreads to the lung, it spreads to the bone where it causes expansile lesions, and it spreads to the central nervous system where it is frequently hemorrhagic. One thing to understand about, differenti uh, about differentiated thyroid cancer in general, both papillary and follicular carcinoma, is that the degree of iodine avidity on nuclear medicine scans is inversely proportional to the FDG avidity. That is, the more differentiated the cancer is, the more likely it is to take up iodine on an iodine scan. The more dedifferentiated it becomes, the less iodine it takes up, the more FDG it takes up. So that's why these two scans iodine scans and FDG scans are seen as complementary in the evaluation of metastatic disease for differentiated thyroid cancer. Medullary carcinoma is strongly uh, associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes. It arises from the chromaffin cells. It is not an iodine avid tumor uh, because it's not arising from the thyroid cells. There is variable FDG uptake in medullary carcinoma. It cannot be reliably evaluated with PET-CT unless you know that it is an FDG avid tumor. And medullary carcinoma has various modes of spread. It will invade locally, it will spread to nodes, and it will spread hematogenously. It'll take a page from any of the other carcinoma books. Anaplastic thyroid carcinoma is the undifferentiated form. Some pathologists di um, differentiate between undifferentiated and anaplastic carcinomas, but they have bad um, overall prognoses measured in months. Anaplastic carcinoma tends to spread with local invasion rather than hematogenous or lymphatic spread. So the table, each of the different types of thyroid cancer has a different mode of spread. Papillary thyroid carcinoma tends to spread to lymph nodes. Follicular carcinoma tends to spread hematogenously, particularly to lung and bone. Anaplastic thyroid cancer tends to invade locally, whereas medullary can do any of the above. This is one of my favorite radiologic images of all time because if you look carefully, you can put all the pieces together, do your detective work, and come up with a definitive diagnosis. The obvious finding is this cystic mass sitting just behind the internal jugular vein. You can see that the vein has been crushed up forward by this, uh, this mass. It is purely cystic. There's not even an appreciable wall. It would be very inviting to try and call this a lower branchial cleft cyst. But if you look carefully, there's actually a friend here. There's another lymph node that is partially cystic and partially solid. And if you look even closer, you can find the primary tumor. These fine speckled calcifications here uh, 
Those are the calcifications of a primary papillary thyroid carcinoma, and these cystic masses are the metastases. Purely cystic, no discernible wall, metastatic disease from papillary thyroid carcinoma. That's a really important concept. Sometimes papillary thyroid carcinoma has um, metastases that are solid and enhancing. Sometimes they have areas of calcification. They're not all cystic. Often they are cystic with a mural nodule. So there's really, it's really quite variable what these uh, metastases may look like radiologically. When follicular carcinoma metastasizes, it often goes to bone and it has an expansile appearance. These metastases are usually quite FDG avid, as seen in the scapula. Here's an example of a thyroid cancer with aggressive local spread. You can see that the primary tumor has invaded through the tracheal wall, and you can see this lobular appearance of the invaded tumor. The tracheoesophageal groove is completely replaced by tumor. We would expect in this case to have a vocal cord paralysis. Very aggressive local spread, and this is an example of anaplastic thyroid cancer. Here's another example of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma with extensive invasion of surrounding structures. You can see that the common carotid artery is completely encased. The tracheoesophageal groove is filled. Here's a very similar appearance. Very aggressive tumor surrounding other structures. The common carotid artery is surrounded. The internal jugular vein, I, I'm not even sure. And um, it's completely surrounding the trachea. This looks just like the anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, but this is thyroid lymphoma. Those two diagnoses, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and thyroid lymphoma, go together. You, they can always mimic one another, and they belong on that differential together. Here's an example of metastatic disease from thyroid cancer to the brain. This is an unenhanced image, and this bright T1 signal is the hemorrhage that is uh, characteristic of thyroid cancer metastases to brain. This is another form of hematogenous spread that we see with differentiated thyroid cancer. This is called a miliary form. There are just innumerable small uh, metastatic deposits throughout the lungs, and this it belongs in the differential diagnosis with the miliary form of TB. Let's talk about something a little more benign, thyroid adenomas. These are way more common than thyroid cancers. Right? Adenomas can have cystic areas, solid areas, calcified areas, uh, all of the above in a single adenoma. Often, when we see a thyroid adenoma, we see it in the setting of a multinodular goiter. And as long as we have numerous hypodense lesions without those malignant features, and there's no dominant mass that's much bigger than the others, we can usually write this off as an adenomatous goiter and not need further follow-up. So how do we evaluate a solitary thyroid nodule? Well, you can certainly use ultrasound, and I think most people would argue that that is the best modality for evaluating thyroid nodules, but you get a pretty good look on CT and MRI, and occasionally they crop up incidentally on nuclear medicine scans. Here I'm talking about FDG scans particularly. So when we're evaluating thyroid lesions, when do we need to do, do a biopsy? If we biopsied every thyroid lesion that we encountered, we'd spend all our time doing it. We'd do nothing else except biopsy thyroid lesions, and that's not good for patients. We need to have a, a, a little more discreet and well thought out plan for when to biopsy needles. So let, uh, when to biopsy thyroid lesions. So let's talk about what features would lead us to biopsy. If there's any of the malignant features that we talked about, the speckled calcification, the invasion, the adenopathy, absolutely, we should, be, uh, we should perform a, a biopsy in those circumstances. But what about a solitary or dominant mass? Well, here we're going to apply the new ACR criteria that are based not only on size, but also on age of patients, so that we can be clever about which ones we subject to biopsy. If there is FDG avidity within 
a focal mass, an incidental thyroid mass, then that lesion has a 25% likelihood of being malignant and it merits biopsy. If you have diffuse FTG avidity within the entire gland, that's probably inflammatory. But if a focal FTG avid mass is identified, that should be biopsied. So the ACR criteria for a thyroid mass are as follows. This is, these are for incidental thyroid masses that are picked up on CT and MR. If the patient is less than 18 years old, then any size of lesion merits biopsy. You shouldn't have thyroid masses when you're, when you're a child. If you're between the ages of 18 and 35, then the threshold for biopsy is 10 millimeters. If uh, the mass is 10 millimeters or more, it is worthy of biopsy. Once you're over 35 years old, though, we expect some adenomas, and so the threshold rises to 15 millimeters before advocating for biopsy. Again, if there are malignant features, that trumps this, and the patient goes to biopsy. So what sort of things do you want to put in your dictation of on thyroid masses? You want to put signs of malignancy, calcifications, invasions, lymphadenopathy, vocal cord paralysis. You want to put tracheal compression, characterize it as mild, moderate, or severe. You want to put tracheal deviation, mild, moderate, or, or severe. And you want to include a mention of substernal extent. Those are the elements that go in a dictation of a thyroid mass. There are a variety of different types of thyroiditis that we can identify on imaging. Perhaps the one we see most frequently is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, the characteristic finding in this case is the iodine depletion. Remember that normal thyroid gland that we saw at the beginning of the lecture that was so much brighter than the surrounding soft tissues? It was brighter because it was concentrating iodine. In the setting of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and subacute thyroiditis, that Iodine is lost to the gland, and this iodine depletion is the most striking finding that we see on imaging. This gland is also somewhat expanded, as one would expect in thyroiditis. Rydell's thyroiditis is a form of IgG4 disease, and it has a characteristic appearance on T2-weighted MRI. The fibrous deposition here that is characteristic of this disease is dark on T2, so you have an expanded gland dark on T2, characteristic of Rydell's thyroiditis.